For Kremo Media's Polity, I'm Sash Numali. Joining me today is award-winning investigative journalist Carl Cohen, here to discuss his book, Sabotage, Eskom Under Siege. Your book goes back to a 2021 act of sabotage when an electricity pylon was toppled uh, near the Latabo power station. And ESCOM CEO Andre Dereta believes this is sabotage to damage the economy through load shedding. I think the question that many South Africans may ask, though, is who would want to damage the economy in this way and why? Such a difficult question, Sashni. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to pinpoint a specific individual or ideology or motivation for these things because the ESCOM is such a big, complicated place that... At any given moment, there are probably 20 plots to overthrow someone at, at ESCOM cooking that, that we might not know about or to, to break a power station or to fix a power station for that matter. Because at this point, getting them fixed is almost as difficult. You, know, you always have to make as many plans as you would do to try and rob a place. You know? So it's, it's very hard. But what has started to emerge is, is that it's very clear that people out there don't want the current leadership of ESCOM to succeed. They don't want these power stations to work. They don't want load shedding to end because it is politically convenient for them to keep pointing to ESCOM as a massive failure of government and as a massive failure of the current government specifically. But there are ways to try and narrow these things down. You know, this specific incident at Latavo is one of the more difficult ones because it happened you know, a few kilometers away from the actual power station itself. So it's not actually even on the power station's premises. But someone knew the power station so well that they knew that this specific pylon carries electricity to the conveyor, the coal conveyors. And that tells us something. That tells us that it's people from within ESCOM that are the biggest problem. But how do you police, what is it? I think it's something like, you know, two... 260,000 kilometers or something of, of, of transmission lines and, you know, these, these massive power stations, you know, it's, it's, it's almost physically impossible to have a policeman on every corner. And you write in your book that the events at ESCOM present danger that law enforcement does not have the appetite or the capacity to fully address. Yeah, you know, I, th- I think that our law enfor- the, the troubles that South African law enforcement have in terms of resources, in terms of good investigators, in terms of time, it, it are well documented. And when, you, when you're talking about ESCOM, you can literally appoint a, a team of 50 experienced investigators, prosecutors, you know, lawyers to, and forensic experts to try and unravel you know, just one contract. And it could take them a year or two years because of the complexity of it all. So, so you have to start addressing you know, a culture problem. And then you have to start doing something which is, which is like a length and breadth exercise. So you make it appear as if no one at ESCOM can get away with corruption or with sabotage or with doing something bad. But unfortunately, what we've seen is that there is, there's a very large appetite from the leadership of ESCOM to clean up. And they have been doing that since 2018. Every single conceivable stumbling block has been thrown in their way. And bearing in mind, cleaning up and doing investigations into historic contracts is like one part of the job that you have to do. You still have to do the daily operational management, the daily sort of trying to catch the new corrupt contracts before they're actually awarded so that you don't sit again in five years doing exactly what you're doing now. So it's so complex that, you know, you you almost have to say appoint a task team of like 100 investigators or the entire Zondo Commission could probably work on ESCOM for a year and then only start to make real progress. So you have to drill it back down and say, which are the most important cases? Who are the people currently still benefiting from, you know, they're not being load shedding or from their being load shedding or from power stations breaking down at a certain point in a certain way and start working your way back from there. But it, it requires something that's almost unheard of in this country. It requires real grit and determination. You know, I was speaking to someone quite recently who unfortunately I I can't share this person's name, but they said something to me that that resonated with me. You know, people who are involved in corruption, they they have something that Afrikaans people call dear settings from where they they keep at it. They keep going. They don't stop. They work together. They protect themselves. They protect each other. They've got goals in mind and they keep working towards it. Whereas people who are trying to stop corruption from happening are so overwhelmed that they often only, you know, they're like running between five different things and they don't focus on one issue continuously and see it through to the end. And I think that's 
really a lot of that has been happening at ESCOM. And ESCOM CEO Jan Oberholzer returned to ESCOM in 2018 to turn things around, as you mentioned. Um, your book deals, you know, with the significant challenges that he faced there. Can you briefly just give us his history with ESCOM, you know, going back to his father, and then just tell us some of the pushback that he received when he returned in 2018? Sure. So Jan Weber also, you know, his dad worked for, for ESCOM for 25 years. He was a linesman. So he worked as part of a team uh, back in the day, you know, it's sort of literally putting up pylons and, and transmission lines, you know, in all sorts of rural and urban parts of the country all over the place. And his dad, you know, unfortunately passed away, but the Jan at the time was also working for ESCOM. And Jan Weber also worked for ESCOM for 26 years before he ventured into the private sector in 2008 and then returned in 2018. And almost immediately upon his return, you know, there were allegations of nepotism. There were allegations of racism. The very first investigation that, that Jan Weber also faced was an allegation of racism because he had taken the power station manager of Tatuka to task for poor performance. Uh, you know, he was vindicated of that and the power station manager was later proven to be in, in basically ineffectual at his job because the two power stations performance has just plummeted over the past, you know, five or six years. Um, after that, he was, he was accused of favoring a certain supplier with vague allegations about some kind of alleged kickbacks or, or something like that. Um, he was also again vindicated in that, but it took two years for investigations to be finalized. Jan Weber also, since returning to ESCOM in 2018, has faced five investigations, including one by the SIU, which looked at his bank accounts, it looked at his shareholdings, it looked at the property that he owns, at his wife's properties and bank accounts, all of these kind of things, all the assets he owns, they did a complete lifestyle audit on him. And not one of these investigations has come back with any finding. Now, Andre Dureta joined ESCOM in 2020, coming off his position as NAMPAC CEO. You interviewed him when he revealed his surprising obsession with English literature. Many may question, you know, what experience he has to run an entity like ESCOM. Can you tell us a bit about that? And then what was his mindset going into ESCOM? In your book, he says he took the job out of a sense of national duty. There must be a level of, of, of either hubris or a little bit of insanity for anyone to take that job because it is literally the hardest job in the country. You are blamed when the power is off. You are blamed when a substation explodes in rural in Pumalanga or, you know, it's, it's part and parcel of the jobs that you're always going to be under attack. So the writer is, is someone who, having interacted with him during our interviews, I, I found to be you know, of, of a very high level of intelligence, someone who understands the challenges that ESCOM faces. But on a practical level, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, the demise of NAMPAC was sort of the writer's legacy. And it isn't really, because if you, if you actually go and examine the facts around what happened at NAMPAC, you, you'll understand that shortly before he became CEO, there were a series of, of transactions in, in Africa that left the company heavily exposed to, to debt, to, to dollar debt tied to commodity prices, which is a disaster. They couldn't extract profits from those countries because of new rules that were put in place. It was really just a disastrous situation. People that I've spoken to have said to me that if it wasn't for Dereiter and his chief financial officer, then NAMPAC would probably be closed today. And he's coming to ESCOM on the back of extreme adversity for many, many years. So arguably he is perfectly placed to understand how to deal with pressure, how to deal with massive amounts of debt in a company that isn't making lots of money. Yeah, and he said this to me himself, if he had come from a company that had worked well and everything was going fine, and he'd then been dumped into ESCOM, he probably wouldn't have cut it. He, he probably would have run away. And this is, this is the interesting thing about, about the writer is that he's not someone who's scared of a challenge. But even he has admitted to me that the ESCOM job is, is tough. It's hard. He said to me that it's a, a job of Sisyphean proportions. And as, as, as the, the viewers will know, you know, Sisyphus spends eternity in hell, according to Greek mythology, rolling a massive boulder up a hill, only to be crushed by it as it rolls back down again at the end of every day. So it's, it's surprising to me that, that he's still there. But at the same time, I get the sense that because he feels it's a national duty, it's like a, a second conscription service for him, that he will see it out much longer than anyone else would because he feels that sense of pride in trying to to fix such a, a vitally important part of our country.
Now, during his stint as acting CEO, Machila Coco bragged about running ESCOM, you know, with no load shedding. And in your book, you go through a great deal of investigating and you lay out your findings in the book. Briefly, just tell us why you believe the events during Coco's tenure contributed to the situation at ESCOM today. It's very complex, but I'll try and boil it down to some key facts. ESCOM's power stations have never been maintained from the, the day that they were built. They've never been maintained to a level that they should have been. This is for a variety of reasons, but mainly because there wasn't always enough money, especially in the early 2000s up until now. There hasn't been enough cash laying around to effect, you know, massive maintenance on these power stations. Then it, it, the toxic cycle continues because you have a shortage of capacity. So even while you don't have enough money to maintain the power stations, you're not even doing the maintenance that you can afford because you have to keep running the power stations continuously to meet demand. Now, what happened during Mr. Machila Koka's era as, as not only as acting CEO, but also prior to that when he held various other senior positions where he was responsible for, you know, the scheduling of maintenance at old power stations and that sort of thing. Suddenly, there, there's this, this, this major turnaround in these, the performance of these power stations, which is sort of inexplicable if you just take it at face value. I dug a little bit deeper, and what I found was that he'd introduced a disciplinary card system for power station managers. Now, this card system would effectively see a power station manager given a green card if his power station is performing well with no breakdowns, a yellow card, a succession of nine yellow cards, you get a red card for bad performance, and then you get suspended for two weeks or you know, without pay or a month or, or so on. Now, the legality and constitutionality of the system is still, I think, up for debate. I don't think it's constitutional. But Coco claims that it worked. And on paper, at least, it did. But what we see from the, the performance figures immediately as he departs ESCOM in February 2018, the unplanned breakdowns increase. So the fragility of the system increases. And Mr. Coco's argument is, is that government told me I had to have an energy availability factor. So my power stations had to be available for 80% of the time. I had to do 10% planned maintenance and I had to have you know, unplanned breakdowns at 10%. Now, arguably, when you're looking at a system like ESCOMs, when you're looking at power stations like ESCOMs, yes, Mr. Corco met his targets and all good and well to him, but the logic and sanity of those targets needs to be questioned because you're dealing with power stations that have never been looked after the way they were supposed to have been. And unfortunately, as a country now in 2022, we are reaping the benefits of those bad decisions made over a number of years from 1998 onwards. The system is so fragile. And what effectively happened in this turnaround performance era where demand was met and there was no load shedding and none of the gas, gas turbines were being run and no diesel was being burned is all good and well. But my belief is it effectively set us up, it put us in a worse position today than where we were four or five years ago. Now, in your book, you also write that ESCOM is a national disaster and that it is time we treat it as such. Just tell us what you mean by that. There needs to be a lot more urgency. We need urgency in terms of changing policy. We need urgency in terms of getting ESCOM liquid again because the company doesn't have money floating around. And unfortunately, the only way to fix the current energy problem that we have as a country Yes, there's arguments to fixing the power stations properly because then they can run. What people are failing to realize is that by 2023, we're shutting down, you know, I think it's eight or nine of these coal-fired power stations that are already struggling to keep up. If we take away those eight or nine power stations, the country will be in stage eight load shedding permanently. If, we, if as we sit here today, those, those power stations are not there. So what we in effect have to do is we have to build power stations renewable energy. We have to build renewable energy. We can't build coal power stations because no financing institution in the world will pay for it. So we have to build renewable energy. But the nature of renewable energy is such that the sun doesn't shine for 24 hours a day and the wind doesn't blow for 24 hours a day. So if you have a solar farm and a wind turbine, it, it's only available a certain amount of time. So the current estimation is that we have to build between 45 and 50,000 megawatts of renewable energy by 2030, so in the next sort of seven to eight years. Now, the problem that we're facing as a country is, is that Madupi and Kusile was started in 2007 and 2008. They're still not done. They're still not working 100%. So how can we reliably ensure energy supply in the future? And the answer is, is that we can't do it through ESCOM because they just can't manage the projects well enough without corruption, without problems, without delays. 
So we have to change the policy environment. We have to open it up so that people can start generating their own electricity. Cities can start generating their own electricity. Because the fact of the matter is, is that ESCOM is already dying. It's been in ICU for years and we're sort of you know, keeping it going little by little with a band-aid here and a little bit of oxygen there. But these new power stations are are not going to work properly ever, I don't think. The older power stations need to be retired, so we needed to start building new renewable energy sources in 2010 already for them just to be in time to meet our, the demand capacity. And this is what I'm saying. When you don't hear the president speaking about ESCOM every single day, I start to get really, really worried because if you think state six load shedding now at a cost of how many millions to the economy every day is bad, Imagine a country where we have no power for two to three weeks on end because of a grid collapse or because, or, or stage two or three load shedding in perpetuity for the next 20 years. Imagine what our economy would look like. Lastly, Kyle, your book comes at a time when, you know, as you said, South Africans are dealing with a crippling amount of load shedding. As with his COO, Dereta faced significant pushback as CEO. So what do you say to those who are blaming him and his team for the issues at ESCOM? Fire them and good luck finding anyone else to do the job. It's as simple as that. Um, you can remove however many people you want to from ESCOM. First of all, you're going to have trouble replacing them with anyway halfway decent or competent. Secondly, it will make absolutely no difference. It will make no difference replacing Andre de Reiter or Jan Wibberoser or Professor Machoba, the board chairperson, because the next people who come in are going to have to deal with exactly the same crisis, but they're going to be at a disadvantage in that they're going to have to try and cram what these people have already learned over the past three years into two weeks to try and understand where ESCOM is right now. So there is something to be said about, you know, constant leadership changes causing flux in an institution. You know, you're never sure if you get a new boss tomorrow, you're never sure what new policies they're going to bring in, how they're going to be as a person, how they're going to change the culture of the company. I'm not saying that under the writer Jan Wibberos' performance has been exemplary. There are issues, you know, there are problems. But at the same time, we have to recognize the challenges that they're up against. They've inherited a broken system. They've got no money to fix it. They don't have the policy environment to address any, any of the problems that they have. It took Andre de Reiter almost, well, a little bit, nearly two years just to get some procurement regulations relaxed so that he can reliably procure from people who actually know what they're doing. To get parts from people, you know, who, who've been making these parts for many, many years that actually work, you know. And it's, it's things like that that, that, would, that would make the difference. You can replace Andre de Reiter with anybody. If they had the right procurement environment and the right policy environment, they could probably resolve this energy issue in the next five to 10 years. But replacing them now, for what? Because they're unpopular? Doesn't really make sense to me. It's like saying, you know, it's like saying that because the school principal is strict and is teaching your kid manners, they should be fired because you don't want your kids to have manners. You know, it's, it doesn't make sense. That was investigative journalist Carl Cowan discussing his book, Sabotage, Eskom Under Siege.